Well, my name is Don Curtis, and I grew up in Bessemer City, North Carolina, which is in Gaston County, about uh, 25 or 30 miles from Charlotte, and uh, a small town, five or 6,000 people. My dad had a corner drugstore, and so I drew, grew up with, uh, in a small town. Our home was only about uh, two and a half blocks away from my dad's drugstore, so we walked everywhere. And uh, how did you get interested in broadcasting? When did that happen? Well, you know, uh, for Christmas in the seventh grade, uh, I had seen a tape recorder, which were, the tape recorders were fairly uh, unusual at that time. And I wanted a tape recorder for Christmas. So my dad gave me a tape recorder. I said, that, I think that was maybe in the ninth grade. And uh, I began messing around with the tape recorder. And the next thing I knew, I I decided I wanted to be a radio announcer. So there was a little radio station between Bessemer City and Kings Mountain, licensed to Kings Mountain, uh, about four miles from my home. And uh, so I called the manager, Jonas Bridges, who became a lifelong friend, uh, and uh, asked to be interviewed. And uh, much to my surprise, he said, well, come on out. So I went out and... Uh, it turned out that WKMT had a weekend position uh, that uh, did Saturday afternoons from 12 noon to six o'clock to sign off. It was a daytime radio station, and Sunday afternoon, same time. And the 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 guy that was in that job was a fellow named Jim Hevner, who also became a lifelong friend. And he was going off to Carolina the next uh, in four, four months. So uh, the manager said, "Well, if you will hang around the radio station and." learn to do things, uh, <clears throat> when that job comes open, if you are, you're ready, we'll give you the job. So I did that. Well, right before I left though that day, he said, uh, you know, your, your dad has a corner drugstore in Bessemer City. And he said, uh, I bet you know all the merchants. And I said, well, I do. And he said, well, why don't I sell you an hour each day, each Saturday, and you go out and sell enough ads to pay for the time? So, you know, what I wanted to be was on the air. So I agreed to that immediately. And uh, so the, the, the first week, I sold $40 worth of ads. And my cost was $20. And that was about the last time I really wanted to be a radio announcer. From that point on, I wanted to be a radio salesperson. But uh, interestingly enough, it was a tremendous break. Because if you think about it, uh, I was a manager at age... Uh, 16. I, I had just got my driver's license. I had to sell it. I had to collect it. I found out that not everybody paid their bills. I found out that not everybody was honest. I found out that uh, I couldn't do what I wanted to do on the air. I had to do what would get the uh, client the response uh, for his ads. So I learned a thousand and one lessons just totally accidentally. I did that all the way through the rest of high school. I started buying two hours a week and then four hours a week and then two hours every day. Oh my God. And so the, my senior year, I had a, a one hour, I said uh, two hours every day, one hour every day. And uh, I made a lot of money. And in fact, my dad said that the longer you go to college, you're making less money each year. There's something basically wrong here. And go back for us and explain to people that are watching uh, uh, what happened with Jim Hevner? Just kind of a short story. Well, Jim went on to Chapel Hill and, and uh, hit Chapel Hill at a time where WCHL was just really uh, doing uh, great broadcasting. And he got a job there and uh, worked all the way through college at WCHL. Where, and, of course, he later became the, the manager and then later the owner. And uh, Jim was... Now, there was a big difference between Jim Hevner and me. Jim was a really polished announcer, even in high school. Uh, I was middling. So you, uh, you had a very positive experience and a jump start in your hometown, and then you went to college. What happened then? Well, uh, you know, as I said, uh, one, of, one of the things I'd like to add is uh, what a big inspiration Jonas Bridges was, because he kept telling me I was better than I was, and it made me want to come up to his standards, which was really interesting. And he became a lifelong friend, and uh, uh, when he retired, shortly before, he stayed in the same little radio station the entire time. And when I went to the Broadcasters Hall of Fame, I set a limousine up for him and brought him down. Oh my gosh, how nice. He was uh, just a great person. Well, uh, from Bessemer City to uh, Chapel, Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, and uh, I continued to work uh, uh, in the summers, buying time and reselling it. And uh, You came home and did that? Yeah. 
it was a great way to make uh, you know better than average money. It was better than working at the drugstore. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> I I I, uh, I I loved the front end of the drugstore because that was merchandising. But I, I I went to Chapel Hill with the intent to become a pharmacist. Oh. Till I took one chemistry course, and I said, "This is not for me." Oh my gosh! I'm not a chemist. Wow. Wow. Uh, and so I was in and out of broadcasting uh, uh, stations all over the place. And then one year I took a semester off and worked in, in North Wilkesboro for Doris and, and uh, Roland Potter, who both became later presidents of the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters. And they were very good. They ran a great radio station, and I learned an awful lot there. And with all of your experience in uh, the commercial radio stations, you didn't get involved with the radio station at uh, UNC? Uh, no, uh, at that point in time, UNC FM was on and off the air. It was not always on the air. And uh, of course, it was doing an entirely different thing. But that type of broadcasting didn't really excite me at the time. And it was uh, not nearly the operation that it is today. Did you take broadcasting uh, as your uh, major at uh, college? Uh, at the university? I took more broadcast courses, I guess, than I took uh, that in journalism than anything else. But basically, I was more interested in advertising and the business end. And so I took an awful lot of... Uh, uh, I, I uh, uh, didn't want to go in the Army. And so I uh, kept putting off my graduation as long as I could. And so what years were you at Chapel Hill? A long time. Uh, <laughs> I was there uh, actually... Uh, Actually, it was only there three terms, oh. Eisenhower's, Kennedy's, and Johnson's. Oh, I see. Well, that was good. Okay. Well, uh, you graduated from college. You yeah. graduated from the university. Yeah. What, what did you do then? Well, I went back. Uh, I, I had one. I had, and I needed to take, I thought at the time, I needed to take a Spanish course to get my degree. And I was going to go back to summer school. But I went back to Bessemer City and found out that uh, the, the license had been granted for a radio station in Cherryville which was, again, about 12 miles from Bessemer City, also in Gaston County. But the person to whom the license had been granted uh, had been convicted of a felony. And so they stripped the license from him. Well, between the time that he uh, got the license and so forth, he'd built the building, a cute little uh, radio station, nice, uh, nice building. And uh, so I went over to, uh, and I'd met to my, through my dad some uh, businessmen in Cherryville, and so I went over and they uh, backed me in uh, trying to buy that license. And uh, it was kind of quirky because the FCC, uh, uh, the rules had changed a little bit, and uh, they said, we can't grant that license anymore. And... Uh, yeah, you know, when you're that age, you don't understand things. So I went to Washington and started walking door to door of the FCC and said, you know, this makes no sense. You've punished an individual and taken his license away, but you've punished the town because they can't get a radio station now. And one of the commissioners said, you know, I think you've got a point. And so they granted the license. Oh my gosh. And the transfer. And so we built that little radio station. Now, while I was in Washington, uh, talking, going around, making the rounds, trying to get the license. I was in my lawyer's office, and next door was the National Community Television Association. I didn't have any idea in the world what that was, but I had an extra hour, so I poked in, and that's when I found out about cable television. I had never heard of it. Turned out there at the time there were only three systems in North Carolina, one in Wilmington, one in uh, uh, Waynesville, and one in Roanoke Rapids. And I was fascinated. So I went back and, and got uh, the same investors and, and got them excited. And so we, um, while we were waiting for the radio station to be granted, and back in those days it took forever, uh, we decided to explore entry into cable TV. So we uh, went around and all across North Carolina and got, I think, like 21 different franchises. Gastonia and Lenore and... Uh, uh, Belmont, Mount Holly, uh, Dunn, uh, uh, Lumberton, uh, Rockingham, Hamlet, and so forth. And uh, we had a lot more franchises than we had money. And about that time, uh, uh, Carolina Telephone and Telegraph out of Tarboro decided they wanted to go in the cable TV business. So they bought us out, and uh, we actually technically merged. Uh, so. 
So we ended up with uh, a, a stock in Carolina Telephone, and then the president of the at the time of Carolina Telephone and Telegraph and the president of Jefferson Standard Life Insurance Company were brothers, the Holderness brothers. So uh, we started thinking, you know, this makes an awful lot of sense. Here's the life insurance company with lots of money. They own television stations, WBT and Charlotte, so they've got television expertise. And here's the cable, the cable people of, of the telephone company. So we formed a company called Jefferson Carolina. Uh, it was a joint venture between Jefferson Standard Life Insurance and Broadcasting and Carolina Telephone. And so then we began to get franchises all over the place. And I, when we sold, I, I promised them uh, a year and a half, 18 months. Uh, and in the, in the meantime, the radio station came through. So at the end of my 18 months, I left and uh, got back into what my first joy was. Cable television back in those days was strictly an antenna service. I mean, it was... Five ninety-five a month, and you got rid of your rooftop antenna, and you picked up a little bit better. But there was no uh, satellite. There was no uh, um, um, independent stations. There was no uh, cable channels. And so it was an entirely different business. So about what year did you finally get going with the Cherville station? 1968. We put it on the air in 1968. And uh, about the same time, we... Uh, uh, had sold our interest in cable, so we had a little bit of uh, capital, and so we bought uh, an AM FM in Lauriburg, oh. and also had applied for one in Mebbin, North Carolina. So we uh, were on our way with a, a small group of stations, and that's that's what you did in those days. Uh, you would buy a small station, build it up, bootleg up to the next level, and you have a small station in Cherryville, and you'd build that one up, sell it, and then buy one in. Belmont, and then build that one up and buy one in Gastonia, and sooner or later you had nice stations. Don, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, radio <laughs> operators were really uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, it was different then, but, you know, you continue that tradition today. You still do a radio program, and, you know, when you started the charitable station, you, you really kind of did it all. Oh, you had to, uh, because, uh, you know, if you, if you look at uh, what happened to... Uh, in 19, right after the war, of course, they had put off almost all the construction. And uh, so I don't think, I don't believe a single radio station went on the air in North Carolina from 19, the beginning of World War II to maybe 48. But then all of a sudden, all over the state, there were people going into small markets like uh, Kinston and uh, Salisbury and building radio stations, a huge explosion of local radio stations. Interestingly enough, very few people had any broadcast experience. Mm -hmm. uh, they were basically entrepreneurs, and they learned the hard way. But in a small market like uh, Lincoln or Bessemer City or North Wilkesboro, uh, the manager really did most of the selling. In many cases, did the morning show, which I did for years. And then on Friday night, you do the Friday night football games. And uh, it was a, a wonderful time to learn how the whole process worked. But uh, that was sort of the standard thing. Interesting enough, NCAB used to start their conventions on Sunday. And the reason was so many of the broadcast managers did Friday night football games. Oh, my God. Carl Venters, I'm sure, did it. Yeah. And Jim yeah. Hebner did it. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think I recall, and I, I, I there's a great photo of you in behind the microphone doing a show, and I believe it's at the Charitable Station because you look like you're about 10, but I know you're older there <laughs> than you are then, but it's a it's a great photograph. Is that from you doing the show in Charitable, or is I it another that, station? I think the picture you're talking about was actually from Kings Mountain. Was it from yeah, Kings Mountain? So yeah. it was even before that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's a wonderful photo, yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll try and insert that, but you've got some great photos. But uh, you do it all, and, you know, Don, you, you can through your entire career, you know, to me, one of your great strengths has been the fact that not only do you do it all, but you're, the people that work with you and for you see you as a great example because of that. You're not sitting behind the chair barking out the orders and haven't done it. You, you really are a worker operator well, as a, well as an Well, it's a big advantage operator. when you're leading, yeah. uh, trying to lead a staff to when someone says this can't be done. You say, I, I, I think we've done this before. And uh, so that, that kind of helps. I've done everything except climb towers. Well, that's good. Then that's a good thing. And I'm not going to climb a tower. Good for you. Well, let's talk about something else. But you you have come through radio at such a time that there have been a lot of technological changes. And you have been on the forefront 
of many of those. Yeah, you know, when I started in Kings Mountain, uh, for example, we didn't have cart machines. You had reel to reel machines. The announcer had uh, an incredible amount of things to do in addition to reading most of the commercials live, but you had to log the, op the beginning time and ending time of every commercial. You had to write it. Now, nowadays you check it off. Uh, you also had to take two transmitter readings an hour because the equipment wasn't as stable as it is as it became even uh, five and ten years later. And then you had to read a newscast at the top of the hour on top of that. So the announcer on, uh, of the small market stations had a really tough way to go. I mean, they were really working. And of course, all the music, all the records were two and a half minutes. You had to do all of that during a, a two minute period of time. And so uh, you learn to uh, cover up uh, your mistakes pretty well. What, what was the power of these small stations? Did they basically cover the communities? Yeah, uh, most uh, a lot of the stations that went on the air in the late 40s were kilowatt radio stations. Most of them were daytimers, and uh, that worked out pretty well because this, is, of course, was about the same time television came in and took away radio's basic nighttime programming. Uh, uh, beginning in uh, the early 50s when television came in, radio became less important at night. And uh, so the, you actually were kind of glad you had a daytimer. And for people that don't know what that is, they basically were sun up to sundown. Sun up to sundown. And of course, that uh, is kind of interesting because it's not a set amount of hours. It's actually daylight. Mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. the way that the ionosphere works. Uh, the ionosphere rises and falls according to the amount of daylight. So in the winter, you were on the air from like 6 a, uh, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then mm -hmm. in the summer, you were on the air from 5 a.m. to like 8 p.m. It night. varied a lot, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. So you accumulated a number of small market stations, Cherville and others you mentioned that you, you had gotten. Uh, when did you first get into your first big station, 100,000 well, watt? Well, you know, I, I, I had been told from the beginning that FM was coming. And it was very slow to develop. But... Uh, uh, I bought a radio station in Laurenburg in 1968, 69, and it had an FM, and that was my first exposure with FM. And uh, the FCC, of course, had allocated radio stations around, and I, I knew there were three classes of FMs. One was Class A, which was 3,000 watts, and another was a Class C, which was 100,000 watts. And uh, when I bought the station, the AM station was a 5,000 watt station. So we were very impressed with that. So I asked the engineer, I'd like, to, I'd like to say I was brilliant and knew this in advance, but I asked the engineer, I said, do we have one of those class A's or class C's? And he said, we've got a class A. And I said, I hate that. I said, he said, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. The class C is the 100,000 watt. You'd think A was better than C, but it wasn't. Well, that was uh, our introduction to FM. And by the time, uh, in the early 70s, people were beginning to discover FM. And uh, so I put, uh, I raised the power of the uh, station in Laurenburg to 100,000 watts. It was probably the, maybe the fifth or sixth station in the state that reached that power. And probably the first, maybe Statesville had one, but most of the rest of them were in the major markets. And of course, it was an incredible experience because all of a sudden you could pick us up 100 miles away. And... Uh, um, so that was the beginning, and uh, we uh, uh, decided that we had to get people to buy FM sets. Most people had AM-only sets, and so we had to put something on that would cause people to buy a set. So it had to be something that was different. Station in Statesville had done the same thing with country music. They became a full-time country music station. Well, we went with full-time gospel music, and people went out and loved gospel music and bought those FM sets. And, and what so, was in cars? Was it AM only? AM, in fact, it, at first you had little converters that you would buy that would convert the FM signal, and then the, only the expensive cars had AM, FM. Had both, yeah. And that began to change about uh, 76, 77, 78, and of course, you know, by the mid 80s, FM had overtaken um, AM. Well, you mentioned the formats and the music that you played, and, and uh, gospel was very, very prominent. Uh, uh, some stations, like Ralph Epperson's station, uh, played... Uh, uh, bluegrass. Yeah, bluegrass. Mountain music, uh, more of the uh, in, in tune with uh, where he was uh, geographically. Exactly. And what his audience wanted. Uh, 
But there was a new format on the forefront with FM stations with album-oriented rock. How did that impact you and your stations? Well, uh, Carl Venters, uh, who uh, uh, is a contemporary of mine, just a tad older. I, I like to say he's a lot older, <laughs> but he, he's just a tad older. But anyway, uh, Carl uh, had the same situation that I had. He, uh, he was in Raleigh with a larger uh, station. He had WPTF which was the 50-kilowatt station that covered the East North. But they had to go into FM early, and uh, they were playing classical music. And Carl, you know, people weren't going to go out in droves and buy FM sets. So Carl uh, developed the first album-oriented rock station in the country. And, of course, what happened was people went out and bought FM sets to get it. And about the same time, Station in Charlotte uh, went to 100,000 watts on country music, and so did uh, Winston-Salem. And so uh, the format uh, explosion began to happen with the uh, additional uh, explosion of FM sets. And, of course, uh, there were a huge number of new FM stations that were put on the air from uh, the, almost like the explosion of AM stations in the late 40s and 50s. It was a huge explosion of FM stations in the uh, late, uh, the mid fifty, uh, mid eighties, and the early early nineties. The FC, FCC allowed you to move in. That was a big deal. You could have a station that was licensed to Wilson, but it with a hundred thousand watt signal, uh, you could actually move your studios to Raleigh. So for all effect, you became a metropolitan area station instead of, or a metro station instead of just a Wilson station, and so. The Rocky Mount Station became a Raleigh Station. The Wilson Station, uh, South Boston, Virginia, became a Raleigh Station. And uh, uh, so all of a sudden, instead of having three or four big players in a market, you had 10 or 12. And each one developed its own unique format. And well, you're becoming a big player now, too, because you're accumulating quite a few stations. Too many. <laughs> uh, and but I, but I, see, I'm a romantic. I ha I, I, we have a... A number of stations, but we've also got some that think they're radio stations, and okay. they're not quite sure they're radio stations. <laughs> but groups, uh, you're, you're starting to see the, the beginning of uh, the big groups like we have today that are mega groups, corporations. Yeah, that, that happened with the, uh, you know, during the, the first, I guess, uh, maybe as late as 1980, I'm not quite sure when it changed, but you were limited nationwide to 7 AM, 7 FMs, and 7 TVs. And, of course, the TVs, only four of those could be VHF. Uh, or only four could be of one class, but VHF was what mm -hmm. was desired yeah. then. And then they changed it to, I think, 14, 14, 14, and then they changed it to 21, 21, 21, and then they got rid of the cap altogether. Mm -hmm. And that's when you had the, all the roll-ups and the mergers, which I still to this day think is one of the worst things that ever happened to broadcasting because it essentially, uh, big, uh, powerful companies begin to buy out all the local owners. Mm -hmm. And so the local ownership sort of disappeared. And uh, there's only a handful of, of, of large stations and large markets owned by local owners, and that's mm -hmm. a shame. You know, you had mentioned Durham Life. Uh, you know, uh, broadcast properties were a favorite investment by insurance companies. Insurance companies, uh, 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 they got into it very early. A number of insurance companies had uh, broadcast stations. And uh, Durham Life in particular, they had done well with their radio stations. Carl Venters was running those, and they decided to get a television license. Mm -hmm. Um, that didn't work out the way they didn't. Well, again, they, they you know by the time, of course, you know Durham Life and Capital Broadcasting went for Channel Five back in uh, 1955. Uh, Raleigh was a unique market. Channel Eleven and Durham was on the air, and uh, WNAO News and Observer had Channel 28. And of course, UHF in those days was uh, very. Uh, the equipment was was not much, the signal was not good, uh, but Channel 5 was available and uh, Durham Life applied for it along with Capital Broadcasting. Now, Capital Broadcasting at that time was a 250 watt AM station and Durham Life was 50,000 watts and uh, owned by a life insurance company and uh, they just sort of assumed they were going to get it because all the big stations across the country did. But uh, Durham Life uh, was not uh, uh, as cagey as they should have been because they didn't get a broadcast lawyer. And uh, Capital Broadcasting, A.J. Fletcher's son, Frank Fletcher, was a very prominent broadcast attorney, and he just ate them alive in the hearing. And uh, they were awarded in what has to be the biggest upset of, uh, of that era uh, 
they were awarded the franchise. Mm -hmm. So and, they got the VHF. Uh, so it was later on when, when Carl became president of Durham Life Broadcasting later, uh, by that time UHF had come along a little bit better and Carl and uh, uh, under Carl they, they bought Channel 28. But by that time, five and 11 had such a head start. It was, a, it was tough going. Very tough going. Yeah. And in fact, uh, kind of a difference of opinion, Carl and Durham Life parted company. Yeah, uh, and, and and that was when I came in, as a matter of fact, yes. because uh, Durham Life, there were some major shareholders of Durham Life that lived in Laurenburg, and they uh, asked me that uh, I think I'd be interested in that. And I said, well, I've got these stations, and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. And uh, they said, well, why don't we buy your stations? And I, so we did a stock swap. I took stock in Durham Life and uh, became the largest single shareholder. Now, they had lots of families that had more than I did together, but uh, so uh, I came up uh, uh, and uh, uh, I probably shared the same experience with, uh, that Carl did. I found out that Durham Life was not entrepreneurial, and I was. And so uh, uh, within two years, I, I decided to go back in my own ownership, and we uh, bought some stations in Raleigh. And uh, we put the first urban station on the air, uh, first black station in Raleigh, and it went to number one in the first book. And that was a brand new format. Brand new format. And, and one that a lot of people yeah. didn't want to take a chance on, but yeah. you, you saw the opportunity. Yeah. And uh, we, we kept it about a year and sold it for the highest price that any Class A station had been sold for at that point in time. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's a tremendous story. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, your story doesn't end with um, buying more and more stations. You also developed some radio networks. Well, actually, uh, uh, you know, the North Carolina News Network, that's an interesting story there, uh, came about because Durham Life... Uh, WPTF in the 50s and 60s was dominant all over eastern North Carolina. And A.J. Fletcher and WRAL and a number of other small markets formed the Debacca Network. And it was basically this, to compete with Durham Life's PTF station to sell farm broadcasting. And uh, then they decided to get in the news business. So they had the Tobacco News Network. And then that got shortened to the TN. So uh, anyway, I guess about, what, six or seven years ago, uh, uh, we had uh, a large news operation at WPTF in Raleigh, and Jim wanted to get in the sports business, and I had the sports station. Or actually, my son-in-law had the sports station, so we did the creative three-way trade. I bought the sports station, traded it to Jim for the North Carolina News Network, and traded an FM station to my son-in-law. So we ended up with uh, the news network, the, by this time, the North Carolina News Network. And we have 80 affiliates across the state, and we supply news and other programming to them. Uh, most of the stations are in the small markets. Now, you had mentioned uh, you, know, you're, you, you were a pioneer with uh, the first urban format station, which uh, was a terrific success. That's not really, you have, an, you have another story I'd like you to tell about uh, pioneering a Spanish language station in Wayne County. Uh, yeah, uh, we um, we had kind of been watching the the explosion of the Hispanic population, and uh, opportunity came along to uh, hire an experienced Spanish broadcaster. Most of the Hispanic stations were owned were very small stations, and. Uh, so we took one of our 100,000 watt stations and uh, changed the format to, Span uh, to uh, Mexican, uh, original Mexican, and it's been very successful. It, the station is now licensed. Uh, we've actually moved it to Burlington because this way it serves two markets. And the Hispanic population is about 10% in that entire area. And uh, it's the only Hispanic station of that size between uh, uh, New York and uh, Atlanta. And I think you uh, told me many years ago when you did that, I can't remember when it was, but uh, when you changed the formats and went on the air, you had a remarkable uh, success right off the bat with your sales efforts. Yeah, uh, radio is really, really important to Mexicans. And uh, we, there were a lot of surprises, but they love their radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we, uh, the f first week we were on, we uh, sold a remote broadcast to uh, uh, Smithfield Chicken and Barbecue in, uh, in Smithfield. Uh, actually, Clayton. 
And uh, the broadcast was supposed to be from noon to six o'clock. And at two o'clock, the, the manager called and said, get it off, get it off. <laughs> he said, I don't have any food left. There's nothing left. He said, I'll pay you. I'll be glad to pay you. Just get it off. That's an interesting story. You know, through the years, we've seen a lot of trends and a lot of headlines. Uh, you know, a new technology comes along and it's going to put somebody out of business. And when television came along, there was uh, people that were very convinced that TV was going to put radio out of business. That just hasn't been the case. Well, you know, other than sharing microphones uh, as common equipment, uh, the, the two businesses are just, and of course, we both deal with the FCC, but uh, they're remarkably different. And uh, radio, of course, has the, uh, right now, is the only uh, media that's not connected to a wire. I mean, we're still portable. And that, uh, with, uh, with this device, we go everywhere now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we're on every cell phone. So radio, has, its strength is basically that it's mobile and basically also local. And uh, television, of course, basically, the, the, uh, as you know, is, is, has always been basically a regional thing. So uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of difference. You know, you're talking about technological things. We, put the, uh, we had the first radio station that uh, was automated in North Carolina. That was uh, the, the only way we could figure it out to be as good as the major market stations was to automate. And... Uh, we learned uh, early on in the, the charitable station was automated. And so we have mega groups out there that you hear about, but Don, I, you know, as I recall, uh, as far as an individual owner, uh, as opposed to a corporation that's publicly traded and, and the big ones, uh, aren't, you're the largest owner th of stations in North Carolina. I think I'm the largest sing uh, individual share, uh, single shareholder company in the country. Yeah, that's what I yeah. thought, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, uh, as far as I know, we have uh, more radio stations and or do more business than any other single shareholder company. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, not so much our success as it is the fact that all the, the four or five big companies have bought off so many radio stations. And there's just not a lot of uh, radio stations anymore in the major markets that are owned by individuals. Yeah. And so how... Uh, people would ask, uh, how does Curtis Media find, your formula is so much different than most companies in that you have a lot of small town radio stations uh, as opposed to stations that only pick and choose others. Why is your formula different and how does it work so well for you? Well, you know, basically, um, no matter what the size of the radio station, the business is basically the same. Uh, you... Uh, are you have three constituencies that you serve. One is your listener, the second is your advertiser, and the third is your staff. And that formula stays the same no matter what size station it is. You may have a station with a staff of 10 people or a, staff, a station with a staff of 40 people in radio, and, but it's still the same. The, it, everything operates the same way. And uh, you, you have to start with the listener. You have to uh, understand that what the listener is listening for. And uh, one of the things that's happened to radio through the years is with the ability to divide into different formats, uh, listenership actually has remained very stable. Uh, we've been buried several times. Uh, we were buried when television came out. Uh, that was the end of radio. And then when satellite radio came out, that was going to be the end of uh, terrestrial radio. And uh, it's found a little niche, but it never hurt the terrestrial stations because it wasn't local. It had a, it had a niche, and there were things that could, uh, satellite can do, and still does. And then Pandora and other uh, internet things have come down the pike. And, uh, uh, but basically, our listenership uh, today is very close to what it was 10 years ago, and, and of course, television can't claim that anymore. Uh, the newspaper business is, is basically in shambles at this time, and so, uh, as as old fashioned as as we're uh, sort of cast from time to time, we are still very very in touch with the listener. You've mentioned uh, that uh, you know one of your lifelong friends and uh, heroes uh, was the guy that gave you your first opportunity, Jonas Bridges, who 
Who are some other people? I know you've mentioned uh, uh, some other people to me in the past that uh, have been very influential to you. Uh, tell us about some of those folks. Well, there, there is a pile, and I'm sure I'll forget a lot of them. And, and interestingly enough, they were, most of them were 10 or 15 years older than I was. And so I, in many cases, I ended up, when they got ready to, to retire, I bought their stations. Mm -hmm. Like Vashi Balkum in Goldsboro was a legendary broadcaster, and I bought his station. Bob Harper in Tarboro, I bought his station. Uh, Doris and... and uh, 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 Roland Potter, who later separated, but they were a husband and wife, and I worked for them in North Whistler. Of course, Wade Hargrove uh, was a classmate of mine at Chapel Hill and, and uh, became my lawyer early on in 1971 or 72, I think. And uh, so we've gone through a lot. Carl Venters comes to mind, Jim Hebner. Uh, we had, I had that experience of uh, uh, replacing Jim as the weekend announcer. Jim's mother, uh, Jim would go to work, uh, or, or we both went to work at noon, and so Jim's mother for years would bring him dinner on Saturday <laughs> afternoon at 1.30. 1 so when Jim went off to Chapel Hill, she just brought me dinner <laughs> every day. And so uh, I loved her to death because she, she fed me every Saturday just like she did feeding Jim. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Jack Brown at Lincoln and... and uh, uh, there's just there's just a lot of them. Bob Hilker, of course, was a great broadcaster. Uh, Bob had a lot of small market stations and uh, uh, ended up with a couple of uh, good sized stations before he basically retired. Bill Rollins, his associate, uh, uh, comes to mind. And uh, gee, I'm, 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 I know I'm leaving off a lot of people. Well, that's okay. There are an awful lot of out there and. The North Carolina history of broadcasters is rich with individuals that um, were on the air and sold the time and were active in their communities. You've mentioned many of them, but there's so many, and yeah. that's part of what's made the association so Yeah, good. one of the things that made the association strong was the fact that we did not, uh, you know, there were usually two or three stations in most markets, usually two, and uh, so outside of those two, we didn't really compete with each other. Mm -hmm. So when we went to broadcast conventions, uh, we could share inside secrets and learn from the others, and uh, there was a lot of that. Tom Harrell in Salisbury is another guy that uh, uh, comes to mind that was very creative in some of the things he did. Tom Campbell and his uh, dad and family, the Dawsons in uh, Fayetteville. Uh, but we became great friends through the Broadcast Association, and that's one of the things that's gotten lost, that uh, there's just not as many uh, local owners uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, the groups, of course, are competitive. And uh, so it's, it's different when you get together. You can't share secrets. You, uh, Don, you, you've shared a lot of stories with a lot of people over the years at NCAB and through your friendships and acquaintances. Uh, you have some interesting stories I've heard you tell. Uh, tell us the story about the broadcaster in Asheville that uh, had quite Zeb a... Zeb Lee. Yes. Yep. Zeb had WSKY, which, uh, depending on what you wanted to look at, it, it could either be whiskey or sky. For, <laughs> and, of course, uh, uh, Asheville also had another radio station, WLOS, Land of the Sky. But Zeb was, uh, uh, I never met him uh, because uh, he never left Asheville. And uh, uh, he uh, applied for an FM uh, channel and it came out during the hearing that he had never missed a day in 40 years of going to the radio station. He was at the radio station at least one part of every day for 40, uh, I think it was like 40 years. It was some long period of time. Uh, and I, but uh, he couldn't leave Asheville because of that, so I never met him. Mm, that is an, that but is that's, an incredible story. That's one story. of the stories about Zeb Lee. Oh, gosh. Well, tell us another story. What's another interesting tidbit that you know that uh, you'd like to share with uh, people that are watching or listening? Well, uh, I, I'll tell you about my, my uh, the first time I was on the air in North Wilkesboro. Uh, I was doing the swap shop. And, uh, of course, I was from the flat country. And, and this was working for the potters. Yeah, the potters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lady calls in, and she wants to sell a steel worm. Now, I had no idea in the world what a steel worm was. So that's the copper tubing and the steel. And, of mm -hmm. course, North Wilkesboro, the, if you didn't have a steel, you just weren't a person. <laughs> and uh, it was the, the entire community versus the revenuers. I mean, it was perfectly acceptable to be a bootlegger or a whisk, uh, you know, have a steel. 
So I'm over there, and I'd never heard of a steel worm. So I said, uh, well, would you describe it? <laughs> and I looked outside the window at the other staff members, and they were out there just rolling in the floor. They were going to let me die. And so she said, I said, what's it made of? She said, copper. <laughs> you dummy. You know? <laughs> and uh, so I, I still didn't know what it was. But uh, So the, the, the rest of the staff let me let me suffer. Well, later on that day, uh, uh, the uh, fa uh, a longtime family practitioner called me up and said, son, it's clear you're not from around here. <laughs> so I'm going to come out to the radio station tonight. I want to meet you. I'm going to bring you something. So he came out and uh, he said, let's go outside. Let's go out back. So we went outside and he had a paper bag about this big and he had a bottle of white lightning. And he said, now let me tell you about this stuff. He said, uh, he said, uh, you need to know who you buy this from because he said, if you get bad uh, homebrew, he said, it can kill you. So he said, so I'll give you some names of some people that you can buy it from that are reputable. He said, but uh, let's just have a little taste. <laughs> well, he gave me, he, he took a big swig and I looked at it and I said, well, I'll take a big swig too. I thought I was drinking kerosene. It was the wor I thought I was going to die. And he looked at me and smiled and said, smooth, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Uh, Don, another one of your great friends is Jim Goodman with Capital Broadcasting. Jim, Jim Goodman. I will also mention my long-term relationship with George Beasley, but we'll talk about Absolutely. that Absolutely. Tell us uh, your uh, maybe your favorite, uh, that you can tell, your favorite Jim Goodman story. Well, you know, I, uh, <laughs> Jim, uh, I claim... Uh, Jim, Jim is first of all has been a great broadcaster, and he's done so many creative things, especially in television. I think that's basically his first love. He has some radio stations, but his first love is basically television. And uh, he's a real community backer, and has just done a lot of wonderful things. But uh, Jim's family and my family were uh, vacationing together in Cancun. Uh, it was a broadcasters' convention, and so we went snorkeling. And uh, Jim's daughter was nine at the time, and my daughter was like 11. So we uh, put on the snorkeling equipment, and we we're out floating around, and uh, we, uh, there was a coral reef separating us and the shore, and you had to be fairly far out to get so that you weren't hitting the coral reef. It looked like we were a lot further from shallow water than we were. And... Uh, so uh, I'm swimming along, and I'm holding my daughter, who's a little bit afraid, and Jim is holding his daughter's hand, and suddenly Jim says, uh, come over here. I said, what's wrong? He said, come over here. <laughs> so I swam over there. I said, what's wrong? He said, take Elizabeth to the pier. There was a pier that came out. And I said, why? He said, take Elizabeth to the pier. So I took his daughter and my daughter to the pier. Our wives, by the way, were up on the shore, up on the hill, uh, uh, not a big hill, but a hill looking at us. So I swam back out and I said, what's wrong? He said, my foot stuck in coral. He had tried to stand up on a coral reef because she had gotten scared and his foot had slipped in the coral reef. So he said, uh, so I, I dive down and I, uh, I at that time I, I had, uh, I was nearsighted. So I had to get real close and I'm looking at you know, his foot. And of course the waves are coming in. So I came up and he said, what's wrong? I said, your foot stuck. <laughs> Well, I tried to get it out, and I couldn't. And, of course, what was happening is Jim was uh, floating on the water, and he was bumping the coral reef. And so I look up on the shore, and I say to Barbara Goodman and Barbara Curtis, like this, and they say, <laughs> hello. They think I'm waving. I don't know what they thought. But anyway, Jim is a little panicky. And I finally got down, and I worked his foot around. I, I, I knew if it went in, it would come out. But what would happen is every time I'd get in sort of position, a wave would come in. So uh, I don't think Jim was any uh, real threat because, you know, the tides don't change a lot down there. But I've always told Jim that I saved his life. And, he, <laughs> and you know, he, he says he still has nightmares about that. Is that right? Yep. Wow. Let's talk about George Beasley for a minute because George uh, has an interesting uh, history. Uh, he actually was an educator. Yeah, uh, George... <clears throat> Uh, and of course, he came from a family. His his wife was an Epperson, and uh, the radio station you mentioned in Mount Airy was Ralph Epperson's radio station. And so Ralph had uh, a couple of sons, 
that got into broadcasting and uh, uh, in the Mount Airy area and uh, Elkin and up in that direction. And Ralph was in, in Mount Airy and a couple of uh, small markets in Virginia. And George had gone to uh, Appalachian State and got kind of interested. And so he, uh, Ralph, with his uh, guidance, uh, applied for a little radio station in Lenore, which, by the way, we later bought. And I keep telling George he needs to buy it back. But uh, uh, that's one of mine that still pretends it's a radio station. Uh, but uh, so George got interested in broadcasting, but he was still an educator. And he sold that station and then went to uh, uh, the eastern part of the state and became a high school principal and bought a radio station in Selma. And he, and he finished his duties as a high school principal and go out every afternoon and run the radio station for a couple of hours. And then, of course, he started buying, uh, uh, he did the same thing with the rest of us. He'd buy small markets and build them up and sell them. And, uh, now, George uh, had, has taken an entirely different approach from me in that he, uh, I, everything I own is in North Carolina. Uh, but George uh, never buy any travel. So he, he first went to Georgia and then uh, he's got stations in Las Vegas. And now he's going into much larger markets. He's in Boston and Philadelphia and, and Detroit and Charlotte. And uh, so, uh, and through the years, I've bought radio stations from him. I bought his stations in Goldsboro, and I've re most recently bought his stations in Coastal Carolina, Greenville, Newburn, and, Spar and uh, Jacksonville. But uh, George is, uh, uh, and at one, uh, at one time, George had bought the most expensive radio station in the country, K Earth in uh, Los Angeles. But George has done extraordinarily well, and his whole family is in broadcasting. His, Three sons and his daughter, his daughter Caroline, runs the place now pretty much. And uh, But George has been a lifelong friend. Don, have you ever sold any of your stations? Oh, yes. Yeah, you, you, all along the way, you sell them to buy You did sell them by others. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're some people buy things and don't ever, you know, get rid of them. But you have Well, I've, I've had a few like that, too. But uh, but uh, maybe some of those that I have that I haven't sold is uh, there's nobody that really wants to buy them. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm sort of a romantic. I have uh, in the sense that I usually hold on. If I buy a radio station that maybe has three or a group that has four stations and one of them may be small, I'm a little bit of a romantic. I like to keep the small stations. So we have uh, some very small stations. and We have uh, six stations in the Boone area, and we have one that's very small, but I, we still have as much fun running that one as we do the, the other stations. You know, Don, you're a great inspiration to a lot of people. Uh, not only have you been in this business, how many years now? Well, it's, uh, 57, uh, what's it, 67, 70, you know, uh, I was 70 years old. And I, was, I guess 60 years. 60 yeah, years. Yeah. And still, you're extremely active. You're a hands-on operator. Uh, you have managers that run stations and and other people, but uh, you're you're very much in the hunt every single day. I really have enjoyed every moment, and uh, I'm at the point in time where I can basically spend the time on the things I really enjoy more than anything else. But uh, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of great people that have worked with me and for me, and some of them have gone on to buy their own stations, and, and many of them have gone on to great jobs, and I'm always very proud of them when they do that. So what's the next thing for Don Curtis? I don't know. Um, you know, one of the things I did about uh, 20 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, I had what I called a company convention, and I was I had the, every employee we had, and I was encouraging them to have a plan. I said, you know, you need to have a plan. You need to know where you want to go, and I made a big to-do about it, and so I finished, I guess, a 15 or 20-minute uh, speech on it was important to know where you wanted to go in life with your career, whether you wanted to go into ownership or become a, a manager or whatever. So I said, are there any questions? And somebody said, well, what about your plans? And I, it suddenly hit me. I've never had a plan in my life. I mean, I just assumed that we were going to grow and that opportunities come up that uh, change all the time. And I don't know that you can do much long range planning anymore other than commit to grow. And, uh, one of the things that I've uh, I've learned through the years is that uh, uh, you're either uh, there is no such thing as building a company. You are constantly building it, and if you ever stop, the company will start going backwards. Uh, 
So as long as I'm uh, going in, we, we'll continue to grow. Uh, at some point in time, I'll uh, have to my runway will get short, and I'll have to turn it all over to somebody else. But you have to separate the company from yourself. It's two different things. E even if you're a, a single shareholder company like I am, your personal life and your personal investment is different than the company. The company has a life of its own, and it will go on in some form or another uh, with or without the ownership, or, or the ownership can change. So you have to separate that, and you have to realize that uh, the company has to continue to grow. Otherwise, you don't have opportunity for your employee, employees, and also things just change. Markets change and so forth. So we, uh, as long as I'm capable of going in and operating, we'll, we'll keep growing. And at some point in time, my runway will get too, uh, so short, I'll have to quit and hand it over to somebody else. What, uh, what do you think the best advice was that you ever got from an individual? Gee, that's a great question. I've had so many people. Uh, one of the things early on, uh, well, I, 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 two things come to mind. Uh, one was my first uh, senior partner, Greer Beam, who had Carolina freight carriers, invested in both my first radio station and my cable TV company. And uh, uh, one time we had bought a little piece of property uh, for a potential tower. And uh, we bought it, and, and, and the way I was financing things at the time, he, he and the, the other shareholders, we were signing notes. And the bank called me up and said that they thought it was time to pay off the loan. It wasn't a big, big loan, so I called shareholder number one, and he said, well, I, I, I'll come up with mine. And he said, it's not a good time. And shareholder number two said about the same thing. And, I, and it was, of course, it was, I didn't have a lot of money. So I called Mr. Beam, and he said, uh, have you been paying the interest? And I said, yes. He said, are you delinquent? And I said, no. He said, well, tell him you can't pay it. Well, that thought hadn't crossed my mind. And so I called the bank. I said, we can't pay it. And they said, fine, we'll renew it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so later on, I saw him. And he said, "No." Nah. He said, "All the bank was going to do was take your money and loan it to somebody else." He said, "That's how they make their money. They weren't doing you a great favor to loan you money." And so, one of the great lessons I learned in life was that banks are not doing you a favor to loan you money. They're making money on you, and that was one lesson. Another lesson I think was. Uh, when I was in the cable TV business, uh, the first big system we built was in Gastonia, and that was the first big system that was built in the state. So all the manufacturers wanted it because they were gonna use that as a, a, a way of getting in, the, because cable TV was getting ready to explode. And uh, W.J. Farr, he had Farr Yarns, you pass it uh, between Charlotte and uh, Christmas Town, you heard of McAdville, that, that was his town. Mr. Farr was a, a, a very good and shrewd businessman, but he was also very benevolent to his employees. And uh, so anyway, uh, I was bragging to my board about uh, the prices we were getting. At that time, it cost about four thousand dollars a month to build a mile, uh, four thousand dollars a mile to build a mile of cable, and we were getting bids in the thirty-four hundred and thirty-two hundred range. And so I was bragging to my board about it. And I said, you know, most of the, I said, this is below their cost. And I said, they're doing it as a loss leader. And Mr. Farr said, well, I don't know too much about this cable TV thing. Remember, there weren't only three systems in the state at that time. He said, but it sounds like to me that you're selling quality. And I said, we, we, we are. He said, a better picture. And uh, getting rid of an ugly rooftop antenna. And I said, that's right. He said, well, it's been my experience that quality costs. And he said, uh, uh, I think all of these companies have good intentions right now of building you a system. But he said, it's been my experience when somebody's losing money, they try to figure a way to keep from losing as much. So he said, uh, and he, he referred to the rest of the board, and they were all wealthy people. And he said, I think... The rest of the boys will go along with this. But he said, why don't you call up the company that you think is the best? And I said, well, ironically, that's the company with the lowest bid. He said, well, call them up, tell them to figure out their price, and add 12.5% to it. I said, well, that's going to be like $3,800. That's going to cost us two or $300,000. He said, I don't think it'll cost you anything in the long run. Uh, but he said, 
uh, so I called up the, the president of Gerald Electronics, and the president was Milton Schaap, who later became governor of Pennsylvania. And I said, Mr. Schaap, you ain't going to believe this. I said, your bid is in at $3,200. My board turned it down. They want you to figure out your real cost and add 12.5% to it. He said, what? I said, they want. He said, that's going to be a lot more. And I said, no, but that's what they want you to do. And he said, well, uh, why do they do that? And I said, well, it's been their experience that once someone gets a bid, they begin to find ways to cut their losses. He just broke out in laughter. He said, we've had two meetings today. <laughs> now we're going to economize on this deal. He said, that's one smart board. He said, I'm going I'm to match them. He said, I'm going to figure out my cost and add 6%. He said, but that's going to be a lot more. And he said, I promise you, I'll build you the best system you've ever built. So I think uh, later on, I was talking to Mr. Uh, Farr, and he said, you know, everybody deserves to make a profit. And he said, that's, so that's one of the, things that I've sort of built my business on is that everybody deserves uh, a profit. If they're an advertiser, they deserve to be, able, you know, everybody wants the best deal they can get, but they deserve to make a profit. And employees deserve the right to have their own career. And if I don't have the opportunity for them, I ought to be supportive of them when they find a better job. And so we have had a number of Trip Savory, the current president of my company. This is his third tour with my company. He, uh, he left twice before because he had better jobs, and we encourage that. So I think, uh, you know, trying to be, uh, uh, and I'm not like, unlike anybody else, I like to do as well as I can, but the truth of the matter is you've got to let everybody else make, uh, make a buck. Uh, you know, that's the way the capital system works, and uh, that's okay. So I, those two things come to mind as far as the best advice I've ever had. What's the best advice you have for us? Well, I don't know. You know, the, the, um, I think that the thing we've always got to remember, whether we're in radio or television or any form, we've got to remember our constituencies. I mean, you know, we serve listeners and we serve advertisers, and they in turn supply the money that, that uh, keeps the rest of our constituencies, our employees and associates, uh, with the job. If we ever forget them uh, and what's in their best interest, we, we're, we're headed the wrong way. So, you know, it, it's business is basically pretty simple. I mean, you 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 have a product or service, and it costs so much to to make it or or, or produce it. And then you sell it for this much and you get to keep the rest. And, uh, you know, when you get away from trying to make it more complicated than that, you really create all sorts of, uh, of uh, things that are not healthy. So it's just important to remember that basically business is pretty simple and to keep it simple. Good advice. Anything else you'd like to add today? Well, uh, no, it's just a wonderful business. I did make some notes. Let me, let me look Let's at see my See if there's notes. anything you forgot. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, we were talking about radio. Radio had, uh, has had two or three different eras. You know, that period in the, uh, the 48 to 60 was the era of the explosion of daytime AM stations. And then the full-time AM sort of came back from the 60s to the maybe the 72. And then that's when the FM explosion began. And then, of course, everything changed with the Communication Act of 96 uh, when they allowed ownership to, uh, to uh, blossom to where, I mean, uh, iHeart or Clear Channel now has 12 or 1,300 radio stations. And at one time, we were limited to seven. So that changed things. And then the, the most uh, recent uh, uh, explosion in radio has been the translators, which mm -hmm. allow AM stations to go on the FM band as well. And uh, so, uh, but you know, keeping up with the changes, uh, understanding the cell phone and streaming and the internet is a part of the opportunity instead of uh, uh, something that uh, is a competitor. Uh, you hop on it. You don't, uh, you, you look around and say, where does this fit in with what we're doing? Um, I was looking down some of my list of names that were. Uh, great names when I got in the broadcasting business, Earl Gluck, for mm -hmm. which the Earl Gluck Distinguished Service Award, Charles Crutchfield, Richard Mason, who was the first long-term manager of WPTF, A.J. Fletcher, Harold Essex. These are names that were my, when I was starting out, they were the, 
They were the people that uh, we all admired the most. Wesley Wallace is somebody else we ought to mention. He was the first chairman of the Department of Radio, Television, and Motion Pictures at Chapel Hill and was very active in the association and in broadcasting for years. And uh, he's also in the Hall of Fame and uh, he uh, taught most all of us. Uh, Carl Venters uh, uh, was a student of his, Wade Hargrove and I and others. So. Uh, it's uh, it's it's been a great uh, great time, and uh, I think the uh, as long as there are uh, listeners around, uh, we're okay. Norm Suttles is just someone else that I would mention. Norm had a group of radio stations uh, in the '70s and '80s in Fayetteville and Kinston and areas like that. Uh, Norm retired, I guess, in the '90s. Bud Abbott down in Sanford, uh, uh, he's the one that gave me my. Uh, my uh, what I've got in my parking place is a sign that says don't even think of parking here <laughs> um, uh, Bob Harper we mentioned Jerry Oakley was a, a contemporary of mine who got out of broadcasting a, a, a little earlier than the rest of us but he's a great Jimmy Childress up in the mountains mm -hmm. had a whole series of radio stations if it was WK something K it was a Jimmy Childress station he, he had the same call letters with the exception of really? one letter Cully Tarleton, Jim Babb in Charlotte, mm -hmm. uh, both members of the Hall of Fame and great broadcasters. Cully has uh, retired and become active in politics. Rennie Corley, who you knew, um, was a great friend. And George Diab. Uh, and uh, of course the guy that I basically uh, gave his inspiration to, Charles, Charles Corral. Uh, no, I, I knew him, that's about all I knew. <laughs> But uh, those are some of the names that uh, I put on my notes to mention. Reginald, Reginald Fessington is an interesting story. I don't know that name. Well, Reginald Fessington, uh, I, I, we, uh, if you ever go to uh, Louder Banks, you'll pass up a, a marker, and it, uh, it marks where Reginald Fessington did a broadcast. Uh, and uh, I, as far as I can tell, he invented radio. Uh, he was, in 1904, he was hired by the Navy, and all of this is documented. It's all in the History uh, Museum and the archives in North Carolina. They've got all his papers. He conducted a broadcast from Roanoke Island to Norfolk, Virginia, and played Silent Night on the violin. And all the, he did it for the United States Navy. I mean, all this is documented. My oh, gosh. And uh, that was some 20 years before uh, uh, radio stations were on the air. He later became famous because he did get credit for inventing the tetradyne tube, which is the basis of which all modern broadcasting came from. So he, he was not an unknown, but he didn't get credit for inventing radio. Now, the interesting story was, and this is all documented with uh, uh, his personal collection, he invented... He was conducting his broadcast within two weeks and two miles of when the Wright brothers had their first flight. Oh, gosh. So modern communications and modern transportation goes back to that one week or two-week period of time on the Outer Banks. Mm. And it's all documented. And why uh, it's never, you know, once history gets written, it's hard to rewrite it. Right. And, uh, but all of this is documented with the United States Navy stuff, and uh, uh, it, it's a shame that he didn't get credit for it, and that story had been told. But he and the Wright brothers exchanged Christmas cards. Really? And they've got all this at the History Museum, and that's one of the things we ought to do in broadcasting. We ought to do something on Reginald Fessington, because as far as I can tell, he was well ahead of Marconi. Of course, Marconi was a company. It wasn't necessarily an individual. He was an individual. So Reginald Fessington, he's in our broadcast Hall of Fame. Uh, but uh, the more I look into it, uh, the uh, he he gave all of his papers to the uh, North Carolina archives, and and they're extensive. So that's somebody that we ought to really look into as we look back on the history of broadcasting, because I'm not so sure that radio wasn't invented in North Carolina. I think you're right. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's a that's a great story.